Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we are concluding the series, Breaking Ungodly Soul Ties. Breaking Ungodly Soul Ties. And this has been a series in which we've been examining this whole subject of soul ties. We've been finding out what they are and how are they formed. We've seen that soul ties are linkage in the soul realm between two people. It links their souls together, which can bring forth both beneficial results or negative results. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a bonding that happens in the soulish realm. It's what the Bible says. Uh, it calls it a knitting together. It calls being yoked, becoming one flesh. That's what the Bible talks about when it talks about a soul tie. And we've seen that there are two types of soul ties. Remember that? There are godly soul ties. These are soul ties approved by God. These are knittings or uh, coming togethers or yokes approved by God. These are healthy soul ties. But then we have ungodly soul ties. These are ties not approved by God. They are unhealthy. They are enforced by the enemy. See, one is enforced by God. The other is enforced by the enemy. One is healthy. The other one is unhealthy. So we have godly soul ties and ungodly soul ties. Now, if you missed any part of this series, I do encourage you to go back and watch the first two installments to get a better understanding of the difference between the two types of soul ties. Please go back. I mean, they're right there. Go to our web website, go to our, uh, our app, go to our YouTube page, stay here on Facebook. You'll get to see the other two installments. They'll give you a greater understanding of what godly soul ties and ungodly soul ties. I just don't have the time to really unpack that again. Please go back and watch that. But um, tonight, we will conclude this series by finding out how to break ungodly soul ties. So that's what we're talking about tonight. How to break ungodly soul ties. How to finally rid and rinse our soul of all ungodly, unhealthy, and all unholy attachments. That's my main goal tonight. That's my mission. That's my aim tonight is to break those suckers off of you. That you may come in here watching tonight with some type of toxic attachment to a, some type of person, some type of bad relationship. I'm telling you, it's coming off tonight. Oh, yes, it's coming off tonight. I believe deliverance is going to take place in the midst of this broadcast. I don't care what you tie to. That tie is being broken tonight. Come on, somebody believe that with me. It's coming down tonight. All right. But before we get into that, before we get into it, I want to take a couple of minutes to deal with some of the questions I've been getting asked. Uh, over the past couple of weeks, I had a lot of people flood my inbox on Facebook and YouTube wanting to know the answer to these questions. I ain't got time to deal with all of them, but I think that these few right here are questions that many of you have, but might have been too afraid to ask. <laughs> I'm telling you, these are questions that a lot of you are uh, having. You, you, you just don't want to ask them, but you have them. All right. So I want to deal with these and then we'll get them right into how to break ungodly soul ties. All right. So the first question I received and I'm not going to tell anybody's name. So don't think I'm going to tell your name out there. Whoever's watching who sent this question. I ain't going to even say it's male or female, but uh, I'm not going to let you your identity known. But this is a question I received. And here it is. Pastor, you said that a person should not have sex before marriage. But how are we to know if they are any good in bed? If we don't try them out first. Oh, that's a real question right there. Come on. Come on. <laughs> I know y'all laughing, but that's a real question. And I, I got to give you an answer to that because I actually get this question a lot, especially from my single saved saints. <laughs> I see my single saved saints ask me this question all the time because they are actually worried if they date God's way and avoid all sexual activities. They could possibly end up with a person who can't fulfill their sexual needs. All right. Because we know the Bible says do not participate in any sexual activity outside of marriage. Right. And if I'm a single and I have to wait till I'm married, how do I know that the individual I'm marrying can fulfill my sexual needs? That's that's an honest and real question. Ain't nothing wrong with that question. <laughs> that's an honest and real question. And let me answer that quickly. Um, the short answer to this is this. How do I how do I do this? Well, you got to have faith. That's the short answer. You got to have faith. I know that sound cliche, but it's the truth. You got to have faith. You got to have faith 
that the person God brings into your life, not just, not just the man of the month or the woman of the week. No, I'm talking about the person God brings in your life, this purpose partner, right? Or what the world calls a soulmate. This person that God has specifically designed for you, all right? <laughs> when God brings this person into your life, that this person, this individual is able to meet your need. You gotta have faith for that. You have faith to believe that this individual that God introduces you to, right? That brings into your life, right? Can meet your need. Ladies and gentlemen, do I have to remind you that you serve a God who knows everything about you? He knows your likes, your dislikes. He knows your wants and your desires. This means he knows what you need to be fulfilled sexually. Trust me, he knows. God knows how important sex is to a marriage. It's not the most important thing, but it's one of the important things in a marriage. Sex is. And God will make sure the person he sends into your life can meet that need. Now, there's a caveat to this. God will send an individual who can meet that need as long as what you need is not demonic. <laughs> I got to say that because some of y'all get happy and get too happy with, with God bringing that person to meet your need. And they're not going to do some of that demonic stuff. I, I, I'm trying not to go there, but there's some demonic stuff that that's sexual perversion in your mind. There's certain things they're just not going to do. They're just not going to do. I mean, come on now. That this, there's some things that God outlaws in the bed. Like for example, menage a trois and three or four different people in the bed with you and your spouse. Come on now. God ain't going to do that. But I'm talking about a natural need. God will send that individual able to fulfill that need. So you got to have faith. Somebody say that with me. You got to have faith. You got to trust in your God that God is going to send the individual. He knows your wants, your desires, your likes, your dislikes. He knows what you need to be sexually fulfilled and he will bring that individual in your life. But you got to have faith. All right. What's the second question? Second question is this. Thank you for this teaching. I wish I would have heard it over 20 years ago. My question tonight is, how do I know if I have a soul tie? That's good. How do I know? That's the question. How do I know if I have a soul tie? And the answer to this question is really is a whole nother teaching because I, I, I got to deal with that. Uh, I could deal with this whole thing of how do I know I got a soul tie? I might, might do that in the future. But tonight I'm going to give you a short, succinct answer. Here, this is how you know you got a soul tie. If you have had sex with anyone, you have a soul tie. Is that simplistic? I can make it. If you had sexual activity, sexual intercourse with anybody, a soul tie was made. That's just real. Now, now the soul tie may present itself in your life through many symptoms because there's many symptoms of a soul tie. Let me let me give you that real quick because there's many symptoms to a soul tie. I'm going to deal with that. I want to show you these symptoms. Um, Matter of fact, I'm going to just give you three tonight because there's many of them. I'm going to give you three. Number one, you are stuck or attached to someone that you know isn't good for you. If you are stuck and attached to an individual that you know ain't no good, you have a soul tie. And it's crazy. You know that they're no good. You know they're absolutely no good for you. Matter of fact, they're no good for anybody. <laughs> but you still stick with them. You still attach to them. Ladies and gentlemen, you know your soul is sick when you continue to return to a person that has done nothing but harm to you. They beating you upside the head. I mean, they calling you out your name. They, they calling you everything but a child of God. Matter of fact, you know is, your soul is sick because you even defend your right to stay in a relationship like that with this person. You will defend it. Your friends will tell you you don't need to be with them. You don't need to be with her. You need to kick her to the curb. You need to kick him to the curb. But you justify why you need to stay there. Oh, my goodness. So, so you are stuck and attached to someone that you know isn't good for you. You were involved in a negative relationship and you know you're not in the, and you know you in a negative relationship and you remain there. That's how you know you're in a soul tie. And, and, and let me help the ladies. Ladies, if you find yourself making this statement. I don't know what it is, but is there something? But there's just something about him. I know he's bad. I know he ain't good for me, but there's just something about him. If you say that, you have found yourself tied up in a soul tie. 
You find yourself always going back to the relationship, even though you know the relationship is good. You're in a soul tie. Number two, number two, I got to roll with this. You find yourself unable to connect emotionally or spiritually in any other relationship. You find yourself unable to connect emotionally or spiritually in other relationships. In other words, you have too many individuals in your soul to fully connect to anyone else. You, you can't. You find it difficult. OK, it's like this. You finally find Mr. or Mrs. Wright. But you can't connect to Mr. and Mrs. Wright because you're still connected to Mr. and Mrs. Wrong. Your soul is still tied to Mr. and Mrs. Wrong. So it's, it's, it's a difficult thing for you to connect with the new person because you're still tied to the old person. Ladies and gentlemen, many marriages fail because they are too many people standing in between that husband and wife. Many marriages, trust me, I, 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 counsel, I got the privilege of counseling marriages oh, over the 12 years I've been a pastor. I've been counseling marriages and I've been finding out that a lot of these marriages fail because there's too many people standing in between the husband and wife. And I'm not talking about physically. I'm talking about emotionally and mentally. There's too many souls <laughs> in between. They can't fully connect. They can't reach each other. They can't really commit to each other because they have too many soul ties. They have so many old memories, good or bad, of former lovers that it's hard for them to really fully connect. They can't. They sit there and compare this new person to the old person. Or they punish the new person for stuff that the old person did. Y'all getting quiet tonight. And that is what a symptom of a soul tie look like. You can't move on because you still have your souls attached. So you can't attach with your new person because you have been tied to the old person. Another symptom, you can't stop thinking of them and memories of them keep coming back to the surface, even after you have broken up with them. Oh my goodness. You can't stop thinking about them. They like that SWV song, Always On Your Mind. <laughs> and, and it's crazy because you made the choice to break away physically. I mean, you, you change your number, change your address, you moved away, but the individual remains a permanent fixture in your mind. They remain a permanent, they always on your mind. You moved away, you changed your number, you, you got off of Facebook, but they're still here. In other words, they were able to break away physically, but still remain tied emotionally and mentally. Ladies and gentlemen, you moved thousands of miles away from him, thousands of miles away from her, but they're still on your mind. If you're experiencing that, that's a soul tie. That is a symptom of a soul tie. If you cannot get them off your mind, they are still there mentally and emotionally. You're dealing with the soul tie. So those are the symptoms. I hope that answered that question. Let me go to the last and final question for tonight. And I think it's the, it's the best one. I, I think this, I saved the best for last right here. Here it is. Do you think soul ties affect men and women differently? Do you think soul ties affect men and women differently? I love it. I love this question right here. And the short answer to that question is this. Absolutely. Soul ties affect males and female differently. There is no ambiguity to that. That is yes. That's an absolute yes. They do. Soul ties do affect men and women differently. Why? It's because of the way God designed us. He designed us different. He designed males and females different. All right. I know what society is trying to do. Society is trying to blur the gender lines. They're trying to get rid of gender. Right. They don't like the whole male and female. That's why they're trying to have unisex everything. That's what we're trying to move towards a unisex society, which is totally against God, by the way. That's totally against God. God makes a distinction between male and female. We didn't do it. We didn't make the scientists didn't do it. God did it. He made a distinction between male and female. What gives us the right to dissolve what God has put together? We can't do that. Ladies and gentlemen, the fact remains. There's a difference 
between male and female. And it's not just physical. Y'all know what I'm talking about. But there's some things that God has placed on inside of a man that's a little bit different than a woman. And what he did is, and, and y'all got to feel me tonight, he designed women to be a little bit more emotional than men. That's a proven fact. There's women. As women, you are more emotional. You're more emotional than men. That's the way God made you. Ain't nothing wrong with that. He designed women to be more emotional. I could break down why he did that. I ain't really got time for that tonight. But that is one of the major difference. So if women are more emotional than men, this will mean that a woman's soul tie will be a little bit more emotional than a man's. Did y'all hear me? So, so when a soul tie happens, they both get tied up, but a woman is a little bit more tied emotionally. Why y'all looking at me like y'all know what I'm talking about? A woman is tied up a little bit more emotionally. Another difference is God designed men to be givers and women to be receivers. That's what he did. He designed men to be givers and women to be receivers. This means that when a man forms a soul tie, he loses more than he receives. And when a woman forms a soul tie, she receives more than she gives. Can I break that down tonight? Please let me break that down. For example, when men participate in unlawful sexual activity or sexual behavior, he loses something. When he has a sexual activity outside of marriage, he loses something. Do y'all want to know what he loses? He loses something called strength. That's what he loses. When a man has unlawful sexual activity, he loses his strength. But the question becomes this. What does he lose his strength to do? All right. Because we're giving strength to do something. Right. So what does he lose his strength to do? I'm so glad you asked. He loses his strength to properly commit. He loses his strength to properly commit. He loses his strength to be faithful. He loses his strength to resist temptation. He becomes weak to temptation. He becomes tied to conquest. Y'all not hear me. He's get tied to conquest. He's trying to constantly conquer things over and over again sexually, right? So that's why he cannot commit. He's seeking after that high over and over again of that conquest. He's seeking after it so he cannot properly commit. This means the more sexual encounters a man has, the more difficult it will be for him to commit to any one woman. So that's one of the things a man loses when he does that. He loses his strength. He loses his strength to commit. He loses his ability to be faithful. He loses his, his strength to resist temptation. Okay, y'all tired of me. Now, now, conversely, because a woman is a natural receiver, she naturally receives everything that's in the man. When she, she, she unites with a man sexually, right? She unites herself to everything that that man may have in his soul. She receives it. She receives everything that's in that man's soul. She receives it. Man. So there's a difference between what happens with a soul tie and a man and a woman. Now, they both get entangled up. We know that. But then there's some major differences that happen in a man. A man loses his strength. A woman receives um, everything that's in that man. Good, bad, ugly. She receives it all, right? Nag, I wish I can really unpack that further, but I'm running out of time. I really want to get to how to break it, right? So let's get into that right now. This is what I really came here to teach tonight, and that is how to break ungodly soul ties, all right? Let's begin with the first one. Y'all should know this. The number one thing that we got to do to break soul ties is repent. Somebody say repent. All right. As I stated numerous times throughout many of my teachings, repenting is a little bit deeper than just telling God you're sorry. That, that, that's, that's plain right there. It's a little bit deeper than just saying, I'm sorry, Lord. Lord, I messed up. I don't know how I'll end up in that bed, but I'm sorry. And, and you know what, ladies and gentlemen, 
Satisfied flesh is always sir, sorry. Satisfied flesh is always sorry. That means we're normally sorry after we have committed the sin, not before. See, see, if we just get sorry when we start thinking about doing it, that can save a lot of us. But we, we're not sorry until after we do it because satisfied flesh is always sorry. Now, don't get me wrong. Apologizing is right. That's what we should do. It is good to apologize, but too often apologies are little more than just empty words. We just say it and we, we don't change our life. We say, I'm sorry, but then we go back to doing the same thing over and again, over and over again. See, repentance means an acknowledgement of what you did wrong and a commitment to turning away from that thing. Do you hear me? So repentance is, is an acknowledgement and a commitment. It's an acknowledgement of what you did. You realize that what you did was wrong. And now you're committed to not doing it again. Did y'all hear me? You acknowledge, I messed up, I made a mistake, that was wrong. And now I'm committing myself to not doing it again. In fact, the Hebrew word repent means to turn away from, right? To make an about face. In the New Testament Greek, it means to change one's mind. So repentance is a firm inward decision that results in an outward turning around to move in a completely different direction. Y'all hear me tonight. It's a change of the mind that involves a turning to God and a turning away from sin. You could think of it as an inward and outward U-turn. Now, Regarding breaking ungodly soul ties, repentance is the first step to deliverance, meaning we must acknowledge the soul tie. We must turn away from the soul tie and the person that soul tie was committed with. And we must make up our minds to never get caught up in those ties that bind again. Did y'all feel me? So repentance is the starting point of your deliverance. You cannot be delivered until repentance has take place. You have to really acknowledge the soul tie. You must turn away from that soul tie and the person that it was committed with and make up your mind to never get caught up in that type of thing again. Somebody say repent. All right, the second thing, we rolling. The second thing we must do is release. Somebody say release. In other words, if we're gonna break this soul tie in our life, the second thing we must do is release. What do you mean by release? I mean, you have to forgive. You have to forgive. You have to forgive that person and you need to forgive yourself. Did y'all hear me? That's, that's a release. That's a release that takes place. A release happens in forgiveness. You have to be willing to forgive others. You have to, you have to forgive that person that you got entangled with. You got to forgive them and you got to forgive yourself. If you have any unforgiveness in your heart against a person, you must choose to release that bitterness and forgive that person. Did y'all hear me? You have to choose to release it. You, ladies, watch this, watch this. You can't hate away a soul tie. You can't, you can't hate away a soul tie. Hate only enforces or tightens the hold. Ladies and gentlemen, the only way to loosen the reins of a soul tie is forgiveness. You must forgive. Can I put some Bible on it? Look at Colossians chapter 3, verse 13. Colossians chapter 3, verse 13. Here it is. Put up with each other and forgive anyone who does you wrong, just as Christ has forgiven you. This text says we have to forgive any and everyone who has wronged us. Isn't that what the text says? He says, forgive anyone who has done you wrong. We have to forgive any and everyone that has done wrong to us. This is not a suggestion, ladies and gentlemen. This is a command. And this command is not given to bring us to a point of unhappiness. Because y'all looking at me crazy tonight. Forgive, please. It's not to get you to a point of unhappiness. It's to bring you to a point of deliverance. Now, let me pause right there and parenthetically digress and deal with this, because many of you can't forgive because you think forgiveness means you trust that individual again. That's that's not what it says. Forgiveness and trust are not synonymous. Right. Because you can forgive somebody and still not trust them. You forgive them. Right. 
You let him off the hook, but you still don't trust him. And God is not asking you to trust him yet. God knows that restoration of trust is a process. God is not asking you to go back to immediately trusting everyone you have forgiven. Everybody that has done you wrong. He's asked you to forgive them. He's not asking you to immediately trust them again. No, forgiveness does not mean immediate restoration of trust. Ladies and gentlemen, don't ever forget what I'm about to say. Forgiveness should be given, freely given, right? Forgiveness should be freely given. But it's trust that must be earned. If they broke trust, right, you should forgive them, but they have to earn that trust back. They have to earn it back, right? Forgiveness is their right to receive from you, right? They should receive that from you. God requires forgiveness. You got to walk in forgiveness, but they have to earn that trust. I feel me. So don't don't get tripped up on thinking that if you forgive somebody, that means you trust. No, you don't have to trust them no more. You don't have to trust them right, right, right then and there. Um, they have to earn that. All right. They have to earn that. All right. But not only do we need to forgive others to break the soul tie, we must be able to forgive ourselves. We got to be able to forgive ourselves. There's too many believers who can't forgive themselves. And there's some people that can forgive others. They're good with that, but they struggle with forgiving themselves. They're like, how can I ever forget the wrong that I've done? I messed up big time. How can I ever get past that? See, I know God forgives me, but how can I forgive myself? That's called regret. And ladies and gentlemen, regret is a trip. And I dare anybody listening tonight to show me how living with regret can help you out right now. I mean, really trip on that with me. How can regret help you? If it could, I'll spend a little bit more time on that, but it's not. It's hurting more than helping. See, regret negatively impacts my spiritual because it's a sin. Regret is a sin, ladies and gentlemen. It negatively impacts my psychological because it becomes a mental burden. Regret even impacts my physical because it can literally make me sick. We can't, we can't let regret trip us up. So why trip on things we cannot change? We need to forgive ourselves. Let the past go. Ladies and gentlemen, the truth is this. The devil loves to push rewind instead of delete. See, when you don't forgive yourself, ladies and gentlemen, you give the enemy the right to continue to press rewind in your life. Did y'all hear me? When you choose not to forgive yourself and when you choose not to forgive others, you give the enemy the right to continue to press rewind in your life. So if we're going to break these soul ties, we must release others and we need to release ourselves through forgiveness. All right. The next thing we need to do, the third thing we need to do to sever a soul tie is renounce. Somebody say that with me. Renounce. You have to renounce the soul tie. You have to renounce it. You do this verbally and in the name of Jesus. Now, to renounce means this. It means to give up, refuse, or resign, usually by a formal declaration. To refuse to follow, obey, or recognize it any further. Express that this contract has been canceled. This soul contract has been canceled and the soul tie is cut. You got to do this out loud. In the authority of Jesus Christ. You need to hear yourself say it. And certainly the spiritual realm need to hear you canceling that contract. So you got to let yourself know and all the devil and his demons know that that soul tie has been canceled. That soul covenant, that soul contract has been canceled. See, renouncing the soul tie essentially means you are telling God that you are no longer in alignment with that soul tie and you disagree with the bond that was formed. Ladies and gentlemen, the same tongue that was used to make those vows of loyalty, you know, those vows of loyalty you made. I will always love you. I can't imagine myself living without you. I'll die without you. Remember those, remember those things? Those are vows of loyalty. And the only way to break it, you must speak against everything that enforces that tie. 
Look what the Bible says in Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12, verse 37. Look what it says. The words you say will either equip you or condemn you. In other words, the words you say will either set you free or hold you hostage. So we have to renounce. Somebody say that with me. Renounce. We must open up our mouth the same way we made those oaths and vows to seal the soul tie. We're going to have to make another, some other words that come out of our mouth to break it. Some words came out of your mouth to seal it. It's going to take some words coming out of your mouth. You just can't think it. You got to say it. It's got to come out of your mouth. I renounce this soul tie. I renounce what it's doing in my life. I'm renouncing what, is, what I'm tied to. You have to open your mouth to do that. So after you renounce, the next thing we must do to break a soul tie is remove. Somebody say it with me, remove. Ladies and gentlemen, we must rid ourselves of any and all gifts received by the person we are tied to. Did y'all hear me? We have to rid ourselves of those items. You gotta do it. You gotta do it. I know it's gonna be tough, but you gotta do it. The truth is, Many soul ties live within physical objects because these objects symbolize the ungodly relationship and can actually cause a soul tie to be tightened. It's tightened by those gifts. Y'all don't believe me. They bought you a CD with a love song on it and said, this is remember back in the day. I don't know if they do it now. These are make mixtapes. Remember those mixtapes? Well, all the y'all songs on it. That's my song on it. Right. And every time you play it, it takes you back there. That's a soul tie. You got to throw that mixtape away. Somebody say throw that mixtape away. I know you got it in 1989, 1995. I don't care. And you got some of your favorite. No, you have to throw it away because every time you listen to it, every time you listen to it, it brings you there. All right. So you got to get rid of the love letters. You got to get rid of all of them. As I alluded to last week, if a person has a ring, a personal gift, cards, love letters, jewelry and other relationship gifts, this is the time to get rid of them. You got to get rid of them now. Got to do it. I know you like that diamond they got you. Throw it away. Pawn it. Whatever you got to do, get rid of it. Get some money out of it. <laughs> that necklace, that love letter, burn it. Do what you got to do. It's about being healthy in your soul because you will never be able to experience what God has for your destiny until you're released from those things holding you to your past. You got to get rid of them. And the enemy loves to use gifts to hold you in place. Holding on to gifts like that symbolizes that the relationship is still in good standing and can actually hold the soul tie in place even after it has been renounced. So you just renounced it, but you still got that ring. You renounced it, you verbally say, I don't receive this soul tie no more, I'm done with it. But you're still wearing the necklace. I'm done with this soul tie. I'm done with it. I'm moving on with my life. But you still read that love letter. You see what I'm talking about? It can hold a soul tie in place. You have to get rid of those gifts and all those items. Now, the last thing, and I'm, I'm done for the rest of the night. The last thing we must do to break a soul tie is restore. Somebody says restore. Restore. Yes, restoration must take place. The biblical meaning of the word restoration is to bring or receive back more than has been lost. To the point where the final state is greater than the original condition. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a renewal that takes place in the heart. Ladies and gentlemen, we serve a God who can and will restore us. Because he's the God of restoration. And what we have to do to bring this restoration process. Once the renouncing has broken, once the repentance has broken, the way we keep those things out, we need a daily dose of God's word. And we need a daily dose of God's word in order to develop the strength to sever an ungodly soul tie for good. Because you can't do it on your own. Filling yourself up with God's word can help you make the right decisions and bring forth restoration in your life. See, when you get into God's word, it replaces the damaged soul with a renewed one. That's why the Bible says, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, getting into that word. 
It transforms you. It renews your soul. This means possessing a renewed mind, a new renewed will and renewed emotions. When you pour that word into you, it brings forth a renewed mind, a renewed will and renewed emotions. This restoration of the soul is the critical element to uprooting the stronghold that serves to solidify the soul tie and cause them to be cut out of your life for good. The Bible says the word is a two edged sword that once you get that word in your life, it starts cutting down all the root. It gets it at the root because sometimes we'll break the soul tie, but we still leave the root. The only way to uproot it out of your life is through the word. The word goes deep down and divides that thing right out of your soul. I feel me. So we need the word. The word brings that thing out and it restores our soul. All right. So let me give you those things again. If we want to get rid of soul ties, we must number one, repent. Right. Number two, we must release. Number three, we have to renounce. Number four, we must remove. And number five, we must restore. If we want to experience freedom in the area of our soul, those things we have to put in place. Ladies and gentlemen, you start practicing some things right now. Deliverance is taking place. Come on, you don't have to wait till this broadcast is over. You can start right now. You can repent. You can, I mean, come on. I'm going to pray in just a minute. I'm going to pray. I'm going to seal this thing with prayer in just a minute. But I need you to practice those things consistently in your life to uproot those soul ties. Those soul ties that have been clamoring in your life, that have been tiding you down for years and years. This, this is a 65-year-old person might be watching tonight. Got so many souls in your, in your soul that you've been tied. But freedom is available through these steps tonight. You got to do it. All you got to do is say, I want to be free and walk in your freedom by initiating these steps in your life i'm going to pray right now i'm going to pray right now if you if you you're doing anything put 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 everything down i want you to put your, point your hands towards the screen because i'm believing that total freedom is going to take place tonight father we thank you for every individual watching that you made freedom available through your word tonight that every shackle is broken every burden is removed in the name of Jesus, every soul tie has been dissolved and broken out of their life. I declare that in the name of Jesus, who the Son sets free, is free indeed. And I thank you, Lord, for going through every individual that's watching, going through their life, going through their heart, and setting them free, free from any toxic relationships, free from any abusive relationship, any relationship that will bring destruction to their life. I thank you, Lord, it's been broken right now in the name of Jesus. I plead the blood of Jesus over that individual. I plead the blood of Jesus over their life, that you'll give them the strength, that you'll give them the courage to walk in repentance, that they'll walk in that release, that they'll walk right now in the name of Jesus in that removal. Lord God, that you give them the ability and the strength right now to remove all gifts, no matter what they is. No matter how expensive they are, get rid of them in the name of Jesus. Give them that authority. Give them that power. Give them that strength to do it tonight. That they may experience the freedom to enjoy the relationship that you do have for them. So I bless you for it right now. And we declare freedom tonight. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Somebody give God some praise right there. Come on, if you believe you're free, give God some glory. Give God some honor. Give God some praise. Breaking these ungodly soul ties.